I've been given a rather daunting topic. It's called Lumen Gentium, which really means light of the nations. But this is not actually a light of the nations talk. It is a talk about the church. It's a talk about the flagship document of the Second Vatican Council one of the two dogmatic constitutions. The other one is the Constitution on Revelation Dei Verbum. But this one is the dogmatic constitution on the church. And I'm going to try and just break it down to you in uh, an accessible way, I hope. Just a few of the points that are key points because when the fathers of the council got together, they actually produced 16 documents. But this was the key that opened all the others. And so it could be useful for me just to mention some of those keys that opened up so much after this document was drafted together, finally crafted uh, to be a final document in 1962. And it basically asked the question, who are we as church? And what is our mission in today's world? And the first words of the document give it its name in Latin, Lumen Gentium. We are the light of the nations. And then it says in that first chapter that we are a sign and instrument for unity with God and unity with one another in the human race. So it's basically proclaiming confidently that in the salvific plan of God, the church of Jesus Christ is essential to the plan of what God's purpose is in bringing together the human race, all peoples, all nations, all tribes, all tongues gathered together in Christ who is the light drawn out of the darkness into the light. And that will happen as all peoples bend the knee and adore the name of Jesus. Confessing his name and adoring him, that's the purpose of God, to draw all men and women into that, and the church is essential for this. In the media today, there of course is presented a church that's supposedly on the fringes of the great move of history. Supposedly a church that's a spent force, that's like a museum that you go and see if you go to one of those sort of big cathedrals in Europe. It's a bit like a museum sometimes. Symbol of the type of way in which the church is presented today as irrelevant. But you see, in this document, it clearly states, and it's really revelation from God, that for those who have faith, those who have the wisdom of God, they know the church is at the center of history. They know that the church is God's ordinary means of bringing salvation to all men and women, in and through faith and baptism. And the document, of course, proclaims that it's possible for people to be saved outside of the boundaries of the Catholic Church. But if that happens, it is still through Jesus Christ who is the only way, the truth, and the life. It's the only way to the Father. Uh, all things come through Christ for our salvation. And, and even if they do not know the Church, it will be mysteriously still because of the Church's existence as the presence of the risen Christ in the world, that they have attained their salvation. And there will be within them, even though they do not know it, a longing for baptism. So the church is central to God's plan for salvation. That's the first thing that's proclaimed very strongly. But it's also spoken in such a way where the extra ecclesia nulla salus of the old, no salvation outside the church of old, is nuanced. So it is possible for people to attain salvation without coming to full knowledge of Jesus Christ. But if they do, it is because Jesus is the Saviour, because he has come, and because his church exists 
for that purpose to proclaim the good news of salvation. And so it makes the church essentially a missionary church. This is picked up again later, of course, in documentation that we're fully aware of, where the popes in recent years have been putting to us very strongly that it's the essence of the church to evangelize. It's the essence of the church to bring the good news of salvation to all men and women. So the church is the hope of the nations, even though it's populated by very (laughs) weak and sinful people like you and I. It is the holiness of God present in the world today, but unfortunately there are a lot of sinful members. But God's means, ordinary means of salvation is found in through the church and its, its life. But I wanted to talk about these key things. Firstly, Vatican II shifted our whole perspective. We, we just went through a sea change, in, it was over a period of time, in our understanding of what it is to be church. To sum it up in one phrase, we might say, and I'll need to explain it, that we moved from being a church of the ordained to being a church of the baptised. That doesn't mean that the ordained were made irrelevant. I'm standing here before you. But, um, but what it means is that instead of being a clericalized church, we now became a church that became aware of each person's dignity through baptism. And that, of course, has brought so much. But it was a struggle for this to happen. When the fathers of a church arrived in Rome in 61, uh, ready for the beginning of it and all, already the Roman theologians and the, the traditionalists in Rome in all of the dicasteries there had got together and they had prepared the first draft of the document on the church because everyone knew Vatican II was going to be about the church. It was unfinished business from Vatican I in the late 19th century. So it had to deal with who are we as church. So these, um, Cardinal Ottaviani and Sebastian Tromp, his theologian, others, had already devised a document. And they thought they were going to get the bishops to just rubber stamp this document. Well, when they brought it to the council floor, it was totally rejected. Absolutely rejected. And why it was rejected was summed up by a bishop who went down in history, the Bishop of Bruges in Belgium, Bishop de Smet. And he summed up the problems of the Roman attitude at that time in three ways. He said, this document is too triumphalistic. The way we position ourselves in the church should not be in a triumphalistic way. The way we position ourselves in the world, we cannot position ourselves against other Christians in that way either or against other religions. It ignores the past where we have sinned grievously and it doesn't acknowledge that we're a church that fails. It's just presenting history as if it's one triumph after another. That's not the reality of the church. We need to face the truth. The second um, thing he said is wrong with it, it was clericalism. That um, he said it's got a pyramidal structure. There's the Pope at the top of the pyramid, then there's the bishops, then there's the priests, and then there's the lay people. And all the power is coming from God down through the Pope, through the bishops, through the priests, to the lay people down there who, are, who really are the ones who pay, pray, and obey. That's their function. And he said, that's not good enough. That's not the church of Jesus Christ. That's a construct that's happened over centuries, and there's a lot of reasons for it, which I won't go into because it's too long. But but the main reason was that we developed that sort of idea out of the counter-reformation because in the Reformation church, it presented the church as like a gathering of God's people, etc., and and the scriptures, and it, it objected to any mediation of grace through the sacraments and through the priesthood and that sort of way. 
And so because that happened at the Reformation in the 16th century, from that time on, the Catholic Church built up this edifice uh, where we presented ourselves as being strongly a hierarchical church to the detriment of seeing ourselves as also being the church as the people of God. And so with the biblical uh, ideas that were coming forward and with new understandings of a church that had started way back in 19, uh, 1948 with Mr. G. Corporis from Pius XII, we began to see ourselves as a communion of God's people. And so Bishop Desmet was uh, pointing this out very clearly, that we need to talk about ourselves as the people of God rather than, first and foremost, the baptized people of God, rather than just this hierarchical thing alone. And the third um, thing he said that was wrong with it, it was, it was too juridical. Emphasis on the institution, the organization, the external structures, like it's as if the church was a society with, like any organized institution in the world today. It's not, it's a unique society, it's a unique institution that's really gains its life and its soul from being a communion in the Holy Spirit. And so they brought out a second draft, and it was totally different. But the first chapter was the mystery of the church, and then the second chapter was the hierarchy, and the third chapter was the people of God, and then had other chapters after that. And Cardinal Suonens, bishop from uh, Belgium, who uh, at that time was the head of the Legion of Mary, but really had great insight, one of the four presenters of the Second Vatican Council. He intervened on the floor and said, it's still not good enough. You've said the hierarchy first, and then you've said the people of God. It's still heavily laden with clericalism. And so... They received that, and the next draft, when it came forward, which is the draft we have now, is it starts with the mystery of the church, then the people of God. And when we're talking about the people of God, we're not talking about just the laity, the whole people of God, all of the baptized, the laity, the religious, the priests, the bishops, the pope himself, but all the people of God. You see... When you start thinking about church on that basis, then you have a whole different perspective. It's not this sort of thing for all the power coming down from above, but the power comes from the baptized. Right? And then, of course, there's a differentiation of roles and a differentiation of uh, different states of life and all that sort of thing within the people of God. So this image of the people of God then was taken hold of, taken from the Old Testament, the people of God who were chosen, who God covenanted himself to them, uh, who God bonded himself to, uh, to his people, gave promises to them, was faithful with them, the people who fell and, 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 and disappointed the Lord and turned away from him, the call back again, people who were already on the way to salvation but not yet, all those sort of images were there. Uh, that helped us to begin to understand what it is to be church in a new way, a people on a journey, and there's other gods around that could be taken up and confusing, but the people centered upon the one true God who has called them and chosen them and set them apart and made them his own people, covenanted himself to them. That sort of appreciation of what it is to be church. So that became the dominant image but it was set together with the image of the body of Christ, taken as an analogy from the human body, that the body of Christ, uh, or everyone who is baptized is baptized into the body, a and every individual is part of the body and has gifts to bring to the body, and the body is not whole without, the ho without everybody in it. So that sort of image too was used, a more organic image, a more Christ-centered image, because the people of God image from the Old Testament wasn't as Christ-centered, but the, the mystical body image was very centered in Christ uh, and very much all, every part of the body being in union with the head uh, who, who is Christ himself. So it was those two images then that brought us into this sort of communion thinking, 
But the church is a communion in the spirit uh, by the work of God who's brought us into himself and into his life. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to say is that there was a shift from being a church of the ordained to being a church of the baptized, within which, of course, the ordained have an essential role. The church cannot exist without the ordained. As Catholic church, it can't exist because it must have the Eucharist and the Eucharist can't can't have the Eucharist without the ordained. But understood correctly, we are a church of the baptized, first and foremost, church of the people of God. Okay, the, the implications then for the, if, of that shift was that there then began to be a realization of the universal call to holiness. That holiness wasn't just to preserve of those who were the professionals, the priests and the religious, but there's one holiness, and all of the disciples of Jesus are called to this one holiness. Uh, there are many ways of moving towards this one holiness, but all are called to perfection in Christ. We used to talk about the religious as the way of perfection, and everybody else was the way of imperfection, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> but we're all called, you know, the, the gospel tells us that Jesus called, become perfect, erkomai in Greek, become perfect, become perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. We're all called to the perfection that comes in, in Jesus Christ in, through union with him, through following him as his disciples. So the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit given to us in baptism and, and released more in, in, in confirmation the work of the Holy Spirit is to sanctify, to make us holy uh, and to bring us into union with Christ, in and through Christ to the Father. And that's for every member of the church. But we work it out differently, different states of life. For the single person, it's going to be different. For the married couple, they have their way of holiness. You know, for the uh, religious, it's their way of holiness. For, for the priest, it's their, their way of holiness different states of life, different ways of attaining to the one holiness. Uh, that's a, with a great breakthrough, really. And then the second implication was that the, the council was able to open up the role of the laity in a stronger way than we had before. Before the council, the tendency was to see there was a role for the laity and there was Catholic action groups. There was that famous one, of course, the Catholic workers uh, group from um, Cardinal Cardine that started uh, in Europe and went all over the world. Some of you might have been involved in Catholic workers and once they see, judge and act, remember all that? That was well before the council. And, and so there were, there were these lay movements but they were very much under the hand of the bishop and only gained their right to exist through being called forward by the bishop or by a priest, you know. They didn't have the right, didn't seem to be the recognition of the right for a, a laity to develop out of their baptismal uh, gifting in, in freedom. And, and so there, there was a new sense of the, the role of the laity. Now in this document, it's at a, a, a fairly uh, early stage of development. It's at its inception, as it were. But there are two things mentioned. Firstly, that lay people are encouraged to participate in the life of the church and its ministries because of their baptism. So that's like an intra-ecclesial participation. Right? But the strongest emphasis in the document is on the role of the laity in the world beyond, as it were, the bound, strict boundaries of, of the church as such. The primary emphasis is on the secular quality uh, of, that's proper to a lay person. Because as a priest, of course, I don't enter into the arenas that you people are in every day. Uh, it's, um, it's like through professions, through trade, through uh, in your office or as a student or whatever, the, the council is pointing out how that secular dimension, not secularized without God, just simply secular, in a good sense of secular dimension, that laity engage in the temporal affairs of the world, and they're in the world, and so can be a leaven in the midst 
in the world, in their circumstances, in a way that uh, priests and religious cannot be, uh, and be a, a force for good in that way, for the building of the kingdom. So that was uh, strongly emphasised uh, as well. So living in the ordinary circumstances of family and social life, being that leaven in the midst, uh, for the sanctification of the world from within. That was the, the emphasis here. And of course that was developed a lot more later. And then of course another aspect of that is the sharing in the evangelising mission of Christ uh, and the, uh, the evangelising mission of the church in the world today and the witnessing to Christ in all situations. And that of course has led to the explosion of ecclesial movements after the council and um, ecclesial, new ecclesial communities all over the world. There are communities and movements like we're part of um, that have been spearheaded by the laity. And it's become clear that new evangelization, uh, that the wave of new evangelization that John Paul II picked up on and, and others have now taken hold of in a big way. We've got a synod on the new evangelization at the moment and all of this. It's become quite clear that the spearhead of the new evangelization is laity. And that's what makes it so new and so different from any other move of the spirit for evangelization, any other missionary uh, energizing urge, urge that's happened in the life of the church uh, right down through the centuries. It, it's, it's again like the, the, the first wave of the spirit where it's no longer the professionals who are the spearheads, but it's, it's lay people being raised up in the spirit and taking it forward. Of course, the professionals are there to encourage and to um, take, take help that happen. Okay, so the role of the laity. Now, a few other things I need to say because there's so much. Um, another thing of this, that happened in this document is it's, it's defining the church not just as an institutional reality, but as a charismatic reality. There was debate on the floor at a certain point as to whether the charismatic gifts were still essential to the life of the Catholic Church. And many of the fathers said no. The charismatic gifts were used in the early church and we'll read about them in the Acts of the Apostles, but now we don't need them because we've gone past that. We've got the sacraments and that's where grace comes to us through the sacraments. We don't need the charismatic gifts. Now again, Cardinal Suenen, who's a bit of a hero here, uh, went away with his theologians that night and they went back through history and they came forward with a, an intervention the next day that changed the council mind. And so you can look at it in chapter 12 of Lumen Gentium, where they finally, after they heard Cardinal Suenen speak about the charismatic gifts and the, how essential they are to the church, it says this, it's not only through the sacraments and church ministries that the Holy Spirit sanctifies and leads the people of God and enriches it with virtues, allotting his charisms to everyone according as he will, he distributes special graces among the faithful of every rank. By these charisms, he makes them fit and ready to undertake the various tasks or offices advantageous for the renewal and upbuilding of the church. According to the words of the apostle, the manifestation of the spirit is given to everyone for profit. These charismatic gifts, whether they be the most outstanding or the more simple and widely diffused, are to be received with thanksgiving and consolation, for they're exceedingly suitable and useful for the needs of the church. That was really important. And, and when you think about the history of the charismatic renewal, you see it began in the modern era, I guess in 1901 at Topeka, Kansas, when a uh, a Methodist pastor prayed over Agnes Ozenam. God help us, you'd never remember her name, would you? But um, it didn't matter. But the Spirit fell upon that, that woman at that time because they'd read, been reading the Acts of the Apostles and they'd been thinking, well, this is what it should be like today. And we know that that event happened when Charles Parnham played on, prayed on Agnes Ozenam and she received the baptism of the Spirit. She began to pray in tongues. 
That was the beginning of a revival. We know that that happened only hours after Pope Leo XIII had prayed in Rome at the beginning of the, the 20th century for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit through praying the Veni Creator Spiritus. And he did that as a result of a prophecy that he'd received from a sister, Elena Guerra, uh, who had had various prophecies about the 20th century being the century of the Holy Spirit. And, and so that's what he did. And so it's interesting, those connections. And we know that in 1906, there was, of course, the Azusa Street Revival, that again sort of generated what we now call Pentecostalism, classical Pentecostalism. We know in the 50s that many of those people who'd become Pentecostals leaving the historic churches now sort of uh, formed a neo-Pentecostal movement within their historic churches. The Lutherans and the Anglicans and the uh, Methodists, etc. But the Catholic Church was still untouched. Why was that? In the providence of God. Because we needed the council. That's the sort of folk we are. And so when it happened in 1967, the leaders of the renewal, the temptation was to say, well, this is all too much. We'll, we'll leave the church. And, but they didn't have to leave because it was all written into the documents. And Cardinal Silnas himself ended up getting baptized in the Holy Spirit uh, and uh, became one of the great protectors of the renewal. See, it was all in God's providential plan to do it that way. They looked at chapter 12. I've spoken with those guys. They told me that's exactly what they did. They, went, they looked at chapter 12 here and they said, it's all here. They didn't have to leave the church. And the Catholic Church then embraced the renewal because it was ready to do it more fully than any other of the historic churches. Uh, and praise God for that. The other thing that, about uh, this document, there's many things, is that also there was a breakthrough for ecumenism. Now again, the Catholic Church was a latecomer to ecumenism. The modern movement of ecumenism started in 1910 with, uh, in Edinburgh with a ministry and mission commission that um, Protestant churches have got together and said, let's not fight one another on the mission field. Let's cooperate with one another on the mission field. It makes sense, doesn't it? And, and so they started doing that. Then in 1923, I think it was, they formed a Faith and Order Commission, which was addressing issues of doctrine, not just working together, but issues of doctrine uh, and, and truth, etc. And the Catholic Church started to get interested at that point and they, it started to sort of relate a little bit with this Faith and Order Commission and used to send observers along to, the, to it. And in 1948, the World Council of Churches was formed, which was an ecumenical body, right? uh, drawing together both this Life and Mission Commission and the Faith and Order Commission. Uh, and the Catholic Church sent observers. We were very wary. We weren't ready yet. But then through the, the 50s, there were certain movements to sort of try and get the Catholics involved. And then, of course, with John Twenty Third in 1960, just before the council, he opened up a secretariat for, for unity and, and put Cardinal Bayer in charge of it. So that was a, a real catalyst because then they were ready for the council to make it genuinely ecumenical in the sense of being promoting the unity. And, and so we, we invited to the council a lot of uh, observers from other churches and the ecclesial communities. They were all present there. And then in chapter 8 of Lumen Gentium, you get the, 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 one, the, the one phrase that opened up the whole of the ecumenical Catholic uh, approach. And that is that the Church of Jesus Christ subsists in the Roman Catholic Church. The Church of Jesus Christ subsists in. In Mr. G. Corporis in 1948, Pius XII had said the Church of Jesus Christ is the Roman Catholic Church. In this document it says the Church of Jesus Christ subsists in the Roman Catholic Church. That's the difference. Let me explain. What it means is that the fullness 
of the church of Jesus Christ, the church that Christ intended to exist in the world for the salvation of men and women, that church, that church in its fullness can only be found in the Catholic Church. All the elements that are necessary for the Church of Jesus Christ are found in the Catholic Church. However, there are elements of that Church of Jesus Christ found in the other churches and the other ecclesial communities. That was the difference. A recognition that the other churches and the other ecclesial communities can be a means towards salvation as well. Because prior to that, we were a bit reluctant to acknowledge that. And the recognition that we all share the one baptism. And because we all share the one baptism then, in one sense we're all in communion with one another. And so we began to use the language separated brethren, you know, rather than Protestants going to hell. And um, I remember when I was a boy growing up in Harden, we used to sort of, uh, you know, Catholics, Catholics ring the bell, all the protos go to hell. Um, remember that one? Yeah. <laughs> so it was a shift. Uh, again, it was a quantum leap forward, really. And so we began to see the other churches and ecclesial communities uh, as being in communion with us to one degree or another, depending on what elements they had of the Church of Jesus Christ within them and that made a big difference that was the basis then for the decree on ecumenism which spelt this out so much more strongly okay so again it was a breakthrough for the catholic church really and our own understanding of who we are as church now another important um, area that i want to mention from the document was that it, uh, there's a whole chapter on the hierarchy, and, and there's a whole chapter on this, the structure of governance of the hierarchy. So, in Vatican I, which was in 1869 to 1870, they had intended, when they gathered, the bishops at that time had intended to do a document on the church, and they'd intended to address the issue of authority in the church in a full way, not just the Pope's authority, but the authority of the bishops uh, who are the successors of the apostles. But what happened is that they ran out of time they, because the Franco-Prussian War came upon them. And also the Papal States were under attack by the Piedmontese. And, and so there was a whole thing that caused that, that council to, to be ruptured and so they only had time, because the, that was the issue of the day, they only had time to deal with the Pope. And so they talked about the Petrine succession, they talked about the Petrine primacy, they only did four chapters, uh, and, and they talked about Petrine, the papal infallibility and defined it and left it at that. Out of context, out of context of the whole college of bishops, out of context of the whole people of God, and so we went for almost a century that way as the church um, with this monarchical pope concept without a, con a context for it. And this was a problem. And, and everyone knew that needed to be fixed when the, when the council met. That was one of its main uh, aims. And people would say today that was one of its main accomplishments is that it is recast our understanding of how authority works within the church. Right? And otherwise the bishops would be seen as just lackeys of the Pope and everything comes from the Pope and the bishops just sort of rubber stamp it. And it's a, that's not how it's meant to be. So we began to understand that the authority of the church rests with the College of Bishops. Never without the Bishop of Rome, mind you. And it's not at all a denial of the primacy of the, of the Bishop of Rome, but the College of Bishops. That's why an ecumenical council, that's a meeting of all of the bishops, together with the Pope, is the highest authority in the church. Huh? And so this collegiality of the bishops was a key um, doctrine that had to be developed here uh, in the Second Vatican Council. And so that's what they did, talking about how the, 
the bishops are the successors of the apostles. There's the College of the Apostles, and then there's the College of Bishops who are the successors. And then within that line of succession, there's one single line that runs through it, always within that context, and that's the primacy of Peter that's taken up by the Pope uh, and the authority that he has. So it's getting it into the right context that's really important. And this had implications then for what it means to be a bishop. Because there had been a tendency, as I say, for the bishops to just be the lackeys of the Pope, and for the bishops too, to uh, just be ministers of their diocese. So it was a recasting of, uh, and a rethinking of, of the truth of what it is to be a bishop. And so bishops that are now seen through this document as having the fullness of the sacrament of orders. There's three stages to the sacrament of orders. There's the deacon, then there's the priest, and then there's the bishop. The fullness of the sacrament of orders is in the bishop. So we talk about an ordination of a bishop, not just an installation, but he's ordained. You're ordained a deacon, you're ordained a priest, and you're ordained a bishop. You see there's differing degrees of entry into the sacrament of orders. And so that's make, make, uh, it's taking away from that idea, that the, the, a juridical idea of bishops, that they're just about sort of administ administrating the diocese. But they're much more than that. So that was one uh, factor. Another one was that when the bishop teaches, if he teaches in his diocese in communion with all the bishops of the world and especially the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, then he teaches as the Vicar of Christ. So he also represents Christ in his teaching and that the, the faithful must adhere to that teaching with the religious submission of, of mind and will, just as they must adhere to the teaching of the Pope, the religious submission of mind and will. And, 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 and of course it, it, it emphasized that the bishops together as a college, as the successors of the apostles with the Bishop of Rome, as the successor of Peter, and never without the Bishop of Rome, that, that they're the highest authority in, in the church. Uh, and so the, the present synod that's going on at the moment is an expression of this attempt to build collegiality. There are some voices within the church who would say that we have a long way to go yet to bring about what was the mind of the council. Some would argue that. Uh, whatever, whatever about that, the truth is that the synods are an expression of it because the bishops have gathered, representatives of all the bishops of the world have gathered to discuss an important issue. How do we deal with the secularised world today and how do we bring the gospel to this secularised world? And so one bishop after another is speaking, speaking, speaking. The Pope's just sitting there listening uh, and, uh, and everyone has a say. And then out of all of those deliberations, there's a number of points that are sort of uh, enumerated, and then those points go to the Pope, and then he makes a post-synodal exhortation. So we've had about 15 or 16 of these synods now since they were installed uh, by Paul the Sixth after the Council. And John Paul II had a number of them, <laughs> hundreds, seem to be lots of them. Um, and all of that, of course, is part of this collegial mentality that we're meant to be fostering within the life of the church. Uh, the Pope is not meant to be operating by himself. He's meant to be operating within the context of a college of bishops. Um, and that gives him a greater protection. So my final point is the final chapter in this document, Lumen Gentium. And again, it's interesting to note because many of the fathers of the church, when they gathered at the council, they had the idea that there should be a special document on Mary, the mother of God. After all, there were 16 documents. You'd think we'd have a special document for Mary. But interestingly, on the council floor, the fathers thought that would be dangerous because they were, they were fearful of an overblown Mariology which would sort of be not really speaking clearly to the church and to the world how we as Catholics understand the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So they decided to put the last chapter on the document of the church as a chapter on Mary, the mother of God. 
and the mother of the church. Uh, and, and so that was a fairly inspired sort of way to do it, really, because it's led to a whole lot of um, beautiful um, outcomes. Uh, John Paul II wrote a very beautiful uh, encyclical on the Blessed Virgin Mary, Redemptoris Mater, which draws from this theology of the council. As you know, he was right in the middle of all this theology in the council. And it places Mary in her right context. Uh, uh, and it makes, makes very clear and says explicitly that the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary as media, mediatrix of graces is subordinate, totally subordinate to the one mediator, Jesus Christ, the one saviour, right? And that, but she, because of her unique cooperation uh, as a, the first disciple of Jesus, her unique cooperation with the saving work of Christ uh, here on this earth, uh, through her yes to the Father at the Annunciation and through her yes to the God's plan as she stood at the foot of the cross seeing her son suffer, as she experienced all that, that was her unique way of cooperating with the grace of God that was being poured out through those events. Because of that, now she continues that as assumed into heaven. She continues cooperating with the grace of God uh, as mother of the church, as mother of all disciples. And, and so we can turn to her and she mediates the grace, one for us through Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection to us in our lives. And so it places her mediation then in, in the right uh, order, totally subordinate to that of Christ, but at that level of cooperating with the work of Christ for the sake of our salvation. So we might um, ask the Blessed Virgin Mary to pray for us that we have a deep love for the church. Now it's great at this time when we're celebrating 50 years of Vatican II, it's great to look back and see all the changes that have happened since the Council and to see the profound way in which the Catholic Church has really sought to be who we're called to be in today's world. I haven't said half of what I could have said about that, but just picked out a few of the eyes of the document. But let's pray and ask the Blessed Virgin Mary that we would have a deep love for the Church that we have a deep commitment to the church's mission within the world today, that whatever our state in life is, that we'd certainly be committed to the way of holiness that God calls us to within the church, and that we'd also be committed to the life of the community that we belong to, this ecclesial community being raised up within the life of the church under the wave of the Spirit after the Second Vatican Council, and, and that we'll be committed to the mission of the church, the proclamation of the good news, until the ends of the earth and be prepared to make the sacrifices that God would call us to make for the sake of, of his kingdom. And may we ourselves be, as a community, truly a light to the nations. Bless his name.